Uh, I'm Stefan from Berlin and let me tell you about where I'm coming from. My journey on the web. I'm one of these people that had a tech-savvy father, so I was, I'm 33 years old now, and I had access to the internet with the year of 12 or something, and this was our internet service provider. In Germany, it's uh, called Freenet. I don't think it's, it's a thing anymore. But this was my start page when I opened this thing called Internet Explorer, right? And when I got to the internet for the first time, I was like, what should I do here? And what had happened in Germany is that social media started. So this is uboot.com. This is basically submarine. And this was the first thing with profile pages, and you had walls, and you could write messages and things. And there was 1999 in North Germany, middle of nowhere, really, nothing there. And I was chatting to people from Berlin because we had the same common interests, which was kind of nice because I was missing these kind of people where I was coming from. And this is when I first discovered that the web connects people. So then I moved to Berlin in 2010. So I was working as a sound engineer for several years, but I got bored at a certain point and I became a web developer, right? And then this statement that the web connects people actually changed for me. Because you maybe have, have, have heard of the fact that programming is one of the few superpowers that we have in life. And now the web connects people became actually we connect people. We enable people by building stuff for the web and we help people. And let me quickly introduce myself. I'm Stefan. And I work for a company called Trilio. So in case you wonder how you can uh, send SMS, write emails, do push notifications, do video calls, or normal phone calls, you can check that out. And the most important thing is, I want to be a responsible developer. So let's have a look at where I'm coming from again. So this is the whole world, right? In 1999, this is where I started. I was thinking um, only about my little bubble, in Germany, and I was far away from thinking of anything global. But when we now look at 2019, where are the most internet users coming from? They are coming from China, from India, and from the United States. Okay, so far so good, but this is just internet stats, right? What does, how does that relate to me? Well, I also blog a little bit, and in February, on my blog, I had 300 people from Brazil, I had 100 people from Vietnam, and 80 people from South Africa. This makes me, ex this is actually, <laughs> how cool is that? People from South Africa are reading my blog post. This is awesome. But at the end, that really doesn't matter. Because I think as web developers, we should be building for everybody. And when Responsive web design, for example, came up. I heard this sentence so, so often. We don't have users in a certain region of the world. Or we don't have users that do that. Or we don't have users that use maybe assistive technology. When you hear or when you say this kind of sentence, you're basically creating a chicken and egg problem. When you don't build stuff that works for users with a certain condition, these users won't use your site or your stuff. It's as easy as that. But building a website is actually, building a good website is actually very, very challenging, right? So what do you have to consider? You have to consider the design. Do you know that in some certain areas of uh, Asia, red and green is basically inverted? That red is something good and green is something bad? This makes your whole product useless in certain areas in, uh, of Asia because, well, it, they just don't get it. You have to optimize your content. It has to be fast enough to be access, uh, accessible. Speaking about accessibility, is your contrast ratio good enough? Does it work with assistive technology? Um, there are many things to do there. What technology do you choose? Right, We are today here at Framework Days. Jamstack, React, Angular. Pff. I mean, you can research and bike shed that for hours and days. How do you optimize the network stack so that it actually works properly? And how do you make it work on several different devices? And in the next 35 minutes, I want to talk about the network stack. 
So let's talk HTTP. So HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And the way it works is that you hit an address bar into your browser. Basically, I had to buy a .dev domain. So the responsible .dev, uh, when you do this, basically the browser makes an HTTP request and it sends a certain set of key value pairs called headers. And then the server responds uh, with another key value pairs. So there are two types of header. There are um, request header and re response headers. And then the server gives you what you actually are asking for. And here we see the responsible dev. That's a fairly simple website, and it looks pretty OK. But you may already see that JavaScript is disabled right now. So what happens when we do this? So there's a malicious script in there. It's asking for permissions. And there are several things just going wrong. Also, I can go to CodePen, and I can frame the whole thing. And now this site looks like the original, but it's actually on hosted on CodePen, which means that people could pretend to be me, but are not. So let's have a look at how we can make this site better by just using headers. And the first big part is that, man, the web is a scary place when you think of that. Just recently, thousands of sites were mining bitcoins without even people knowing it. Who has read that? That's ridiculous. There was one script that just had malicious content. It was on a public uh, place somewhere. And thousands of sites were mining bitcoins. Then there was, for example, this podcast episode of Shop Talk. This is already four years ago, but this is so scary. So uh, Shop Talk is uh, done by Chris Coyer. Chris Coyer runs CSS Tricks. And there was one hacker that almost hacked CSS Tricks by social engineering. In case you don't know social engineering, it's basically calling people and <laughs> doing, uh, going for the goodwill of people. The thing is, the hacker almost made it. And the internet or the service provider was the same provider that hosted the global J jQuery version at the time. Think of that, a random stranger get access to the global jQuery. You can mess with millions of websites. Or just a few months ago, again, kind of social engineering, there was the event stream thing happening. So event stream is a very popular node package, and it was unmaintained, and someone just went to the maintainer on GitHub, hey, do you need help maintaining that? And of course the maintainer was like, oh yes, someone wants to help me. Well, that kind of went south. Again, again, another Bitcoin thing happening. Or, for example, my, uh, my colleague Ke Kelly, she called 35 call centers, and she made it to accidentally change people's phone numbers just by pretending to someone. Because people tend um, that they want to help you when you ask them very kindly. So when we're building for the web, we always rely on others. It doesn't matter how good you do your stuff, there's always a weakest point in there, which is the human at the end. And I, have to, I believe that the web has to be safe. So first of all, let's talk about HTTPS. Cool. So when you're not running on HTTPS, you're opening up your website to the hacker hoodie, or hoodie, hoodie hacker, right? It's that person that maybe spawns a public Wi-Fi somewhere and will do man-in-the-middle attacks and can maybe interfere your requests and sniff passwords and these kind of things um, when you're not running on HTTPS. But also, browser vendors recently started pushing for HTTPS 2. So if you want to use cutting extra knowledge technology, like uh, shown in the talk before, like HTTP 2, Service Worker, Get User Media, and all these kind of things, you have to run on HTTPS 2. So in my little front-end bubble, I see usually, so basically almost everything is HTTPS these days. But when you, for example, go to this site here, why no HTTPS? This is a site that um, crawls the most popular sites on the planet um, for running on HTTPS. And there are some German, th big, big, big German sites in there, which surprised me. So for example, Spiegel Online. This is a massive German magazine, not running on HTTPS which surprised me. So if you want to get an idea of what is included in your websites, I can highly recommend, for example, this tool here, which is called Request Map uh, Webpuff Tools. And as you see, Spiegel Online includes a lot of scripts from somewhere, right? This is a lot of people being involved in your site. So what you want to have is you want to have the safety net and you want to be as secure as possible. So maybe you're running a big legacy site. How do you ensure encryption? 
oh no, when you want to run HTTPS, um, you can ensure encryption, and you can set one header that is called strict transport security. And you can define a max age property, which uh, basically is in sec seconds. And this goes into the browser, and the browser will remember this. And this is forcing the site to run an HTTPS. You can define that to include subdomains. And if you feel fancy, you can also include a third parameter, which is called preload. What does preload do? Well, basically, browsers internally already have a strict transport security rule set. So certain sites in your browser will never load an HTTP in your browser. So if you add the preload property, you can submit your site to this uh, formula here, which means that your site goes into the configuration of browsers too, which is really cool, but also really scary, because when you fuck up your HTTPS, you're basically screwed. So the base of everything then is this file that is based in the Chromium source. And you see there that there is the uh, app and dev top level domain. When you buy a .app domain, you cannot load this over HTTP because it's included in this list. So this file is included in the Chromium source, but it's also used by other vendors. So you have to check that out. But strict transport security is not only about security, actually. You can save some time. So what you see here is a waterfall diagram for my personal website. And what happens when I hit stefanjudis.com into the URL bar and press, uh, and press Enter? Well, the first request is to the HTTP endpoint, which then redirects. On a slow connection, this could be two, three, four seconds for nothing. When I have HSTS enabled, I can skip these three seconds, which is nice. So how is the support for strict transport security today? We're pretty green. So we can just add this header. And if you're not worried about messing up your HTTPS, you can use that. So maybe you're using a big or building a big legacy site. So I built on big projects, built big projects, and there were a lot of things coming from somewhere, right? And I didn't know who controls that and why is there an HTTP request in here and how do I change that actually? What you can do too is you can upgrade HTTP requests using content security policy with the upgrade in secure request property. So whatever then is included with HTTP, HTTP in your site will be upgraded to HTTPS. How cool is that? You don't have to change any source code. That is super nice. And here we already see content security policy. Uh, uh, policy. So basically CSP is to limit what is allowed in your websites. And there's not only up upgrade in secure requests, there are a lot of options. Right? Like a lot. Like, um, uh, what form actions are allowed? Where, what images are allowed to load? Um, where is the CSS allowed to load from? Is JavaScript inline allowed? This is there for quite a while, and there are a few cool things in there. So there's, for example, this own opener, which is something I cannot wait for to be ready. So let's have a look at the responsible dev again. So what you see there is a target blank link. And guess what? I just hacked the site that, that had this link into. The thing with target blank links is that when you do target blank and you link to a website, this website has access to the site that opens it. What? So when you do this, you have to be very careful that you also include this here so that the, linked, the website you link to is not able to do this. Guess what? I'm linking to CSS tricks quite a while. Let's say Chris Coyer is uh, cried a lot. Let's say Chris Coyer is a little bit mad at me, and he figures that all requests coming from my um, domain, that he maybe wants to change the URL to something that looks similar but is not the same, and then he can do malicious things there. So we have all these kind of things. So how do you define CSP rule sets? You can include them in a meta element uh, in your documents. I personally don't like that so much. Or you can define a header. That looks scary, right? So this is the CSP header for my private site. And when you start doing CSP, it's like you will break things. So it took me three tries to deploy that into production without breaking things. So, because, so what you should do instead is you should use report only, which basically means that Chrome or the browser that you're using will report into the console, 
and will be so kind to give the information and will send it to an HTTP endpoint of your choice. So you can deploy this and can just see the logs coming and at some point you're like, cool, now I can enable it. So when you look at this closely, you will see that I'm not really 100% there yet. So I'm running with unsafe evil because my JavaScript framework of choice is doing some things, let's say. Uh, I will see if we can uh, get around this one. But I'm also running in un with unsafe inline mode. This, and this is because uh, JavaScript frameworks these days always have this, uh, this JavaScript inline block that uh, includes all the data that is used to uh, initialize the framework. So how can you make this more secure? So when you have inline JavaScript, for example, you can use um, a, a hashed value of the contents of the script. So you see there SHA-256 and a random hash. But actually, it's not that random because it's depending on the content from here to here. This means that when you update your script, you have to update the hash. That's not very maintainable. What you can do instead, or also, is can, you can use hashed IDs, like a nonce value, which then means you can give IDs and can you whitelist these kind of things, which is actually super nice. So I will do that very, very soon on my private side. So how is the support for content security pro policy? We're there. So we can use that. And then there's also content security policy level two, which has some rough edges still. But you can still play around with this. So who here has heard of HTTP Archive? So HTTP Archive basically is the site that crawls the web and gives you statistics out of this. You can then use it in combination with a tool called BigQuery to just query all the data and do nice statistics. So guess how many pages use <laughs> CSP today? I mean, that's massive improvement to block things that shouldn't be happening on your site. And it's 6%. Crit critical silence here, right? 6%. I think that is way too low. So I think we can do better. So when you want to start with CSP, what you should do is you should monitor and you should be sure that you're um, running report only first. But then use it. So with, with included um, CSP headers, what happens is that when I go to slash save, is that the unicorns disappeared because Cornify was not allowed to load. You see that, that, what is, that it was blocked. And you see that the dis on open CSP directive, unfortunately, is not yet supported. Also, when I go to CodePen, and I want to include this one, using the Frame Ancestor CSP um, directive, this is not possible anymore, and nobody can pretend to be my site. And I think that this is very important for us shipping to the web, because the web is crucial for people these days, right? And then I go on Twitter, so I hang out on Twitter quite a, quite a little bit, and then you see people giving talks like this. Your sh doesn't work in Africa, right? Because we kind of sometimes, I'm from, from Berlin, and, and the thing is that data is relatively cheap for me, but it's not always like this. And then I land on the airport here, like yesterday, and I'm with O2, and then I get this message here. And this message is basically said in German, and it's telling me, well, Stefan, you get two megabi six megabytes for two euros, but you have to use them in the next 24 hours. Are you fucking kidding me? This, this only takes 10 minutes, and then this is gone. But the most important thing that I want to tell you here is that data is not equal data. Data heavily depends on the fact where you are at ac accessing it from. So what I want to show you is what does my site cost. This is done by uh, Tim Cadillac. And basically what this does, it compares the cost um, of data um, in certain regions of the world, and then it also compares it to the money that the people make in the certain country. Right? Just because data costs $10 somewhere doesn't mean that it has the same price everywhere because maybe in a certain country people make less, mo less money. And I think this is critical. And I believe that the web has to be affordable. So how can headers come into play for that? Don't request the same content over and over and over and over again. Set proper caching headers. So you can set the cache control header with a max age directive, and then you can define how long this resource should sit in the cache. 
which does not necessarily mean that it, there are no requests flying, but um, that is a different topic. But what is cool, though, is that there is the immutable directive, which basically tells the browser, hey, you get this resort once, and that's it. Because, for example, when we ship front-end bundles, these are usually fingerprinted anyways, right? We ship styles and a hash and then CSS. There's no need to request this file again. So immutable is something that you definitely want to check out. How's the support for immutable as well? Well, but you can use it, right? I mean, that, that's super cool. If you want to go into all the nitty-gritty details of cache control, Harry Roberts recently released this blog post, and there are a lot of directives um, that you may want to evaluate if they may make sense for you. So you can save requests, but it's also about sending requests or s get sending the right data in the first place. So what happens when the browser actually requests a text resource? It sends this request, uh, this header, which is basically, I accept the following encodings. And in case you don't know, the BR in there stands for Brotli. And what I did, I, I went uh, to my local file system, and I had this CSS file for the responsible dev, which includes um, a CSS framework. That's why it's so big. So I started with 100K. Then I gzip compressed it. Then it, we ended up with 15K. And then I did broadly compression on the same file, and I ended up with 10K. That is nice, right? This is super, super cool. But when I talk with people about this, it's like, but Stefan, broadly compression is so, so slow. And this is basically comparing apples with oranges. So let's have a look here. So gzip has nine default levels of, comp of compression. Broadly has 11. The default mode in gzip is level number six. This is the sweet spot for performance. Afterwards, there are not much file gains anymore. Broadly on the other side, is the default mode is heavily focused on the smallest file size. Which means, of course, yeah, gzip is fast and broadly is slow, but the result of broadly is way better. So when you tweak the settings of broadly and you go for the optimal middle ground, what you get is that broadly tends to compress better with the same speed as gzip. And when you ship a lot of JavaScript and we ship a lot of CSS, you can actually save things on the wire, right? But maybe you don't even have to do it like on the fly with, which we do with gzip. Maybe you have a build process in place anyways, and you could compress all the files with broadly, like a little bit slower, but you're doing it at build time, so who cares? Maybe you want to check that out. The friends from Akamai um, did a nice research if you want to dig deeper into that. So how's the support for broadly? Also pretty green, which is nice. So this is the encoding part, but maybe we can also serve tailored media. So who is guilty of writing this picture element? So it's kind of checking for WebP, um, checking for different layouts, serving the proper image. I mean, this is hard to write, and it's not really maintainable, right? Guess what? The browser sends also this header when it makes an image request. And if the browser supports WebP, it will tell you uh, when the headers come in. And you could pair this with something that is called client hints. So you see that the accept client hints header, and basically this comes with the initial HTML um, response, and the server tells the browser, hey, please give me information about the width and the viewport width, and please do this for the next 100 seconds. And guess what? When the browser requests the image, this is what you get. Do you see what is happening here? Now this image element gives us this information, which means that you can tailor the response in your service worker or on the server side. This kind of gives us the opportunity to not use these huge picture element blocks. Jeremy Wagner talks a lot about this, so you can check out this talk, um, and you will see a demo in a second. And then we have also saved data, right? When I'm here with my six megabytes for two euros, I want to save data, and I want to save a lot of data. So there's this header that has the uh, property on. And you could decide in a service worker or on the service side, or even in your application that, hey, when this is true, please don't ship 
high resolution images. Maybe please don't include this carousel that nobody is looking at. And then we have applications out there that have these kind of modes enabled. So what you see there is Twitter Lite. And when you go to the settings of Twitter Lite, you see that there is a data save mode included. And then they ship low resolution images and you can opt in to load these images. I think this is very cool. Unfortunately though, Twitter Lite is not accepting the save data header. So when I said this, they're still sending everything because they decided to reinvent the wheel here. So let's please use the platform and make these features more visible. I mean, how cool would it be when we have our mobile browsers and there is a big, big button, really top and right corner, which is like speed up. I don't want to use that much data. I think that would be cool. Uh, in Mobile Chrome, for example, this setting is buried into a few sub-dialogues and just four days ago they released this, Chrome Light Pages. In case you haven't read that, when you enable data save mode in the Mobile Chrome, you will go over Google server and they will serve you optimized versions of the stuff. And honestly, I'm not sure how I feel about this. There is no other way right now in uh, Mobile Chrome to enable this. So mm. if you want to read more about these uh, Google Chrome light pages, Tim Kedlik asks, uh, Tim is usually the, the skeptical person when it comes about Google and web performance. And he um, digged a little bit deeper and was like, hey, what does that actually mean your stuff, our stuff is coming from your servers? So if you want to opt out, because this will come, you can give the cache control header and no transform directive, and this way um, you can circumvent this. So when you ship different content, depending on its headers, please make, make sure that you um, check out your CDNs and proxy servers that you use. Because you then have to tell these servers, hey, the response size, responses depend on these headers. And this is where the very header comes into place. So make sure that you watch this out. So with this, when you go to Responsible Dev Affordable, you see that I'm shipping boldly, which is cool. You see that when I refresh, things are coming from the cache. And watch out the uh, image there. So it's a JPEG requested. I'm serving WebP. And when the request is made, you see that it tells me it's width. This takes pixel density into account. So it's double the viewport width because my MacBook here has because my MacBook um, has uh, double the self pixel. And you see, when I go smaller, it's just shipping less data because I have the information to ship the right image. I think that's cool because the web is with us every day. But what is the state of the web today? And my former colleague, uh, Zeva, he built this site. This is the current state of the web, isn't it? And that makes me actually very, very sad. I mean, think of the fact that we are running outside and someone is just tapping on our shoulders five times, ten times. That's just not the right approach. And I think that we should be responsible developers. And this includes that the web should be respectful. What includes that? I think it, this includes time. Time is probably the most valuable resource that we all have. And when we sit in front of a screen and we see nothing for five seconds, that's not respectful. So what we can use is we can, for example, rel preload, um, which can give the um, browser information of things that will be needed in the future so that they can be already loaded. This also works with a, with a header. So what I'm basically telling there is, hey, watch out. This image will be requested in just a few seconds. An image is probably not the best case here. You want to do this with fonts or with CSS files or with things that have a critical impact on the user experience and make people wait. When you have a, CNN, a CDN in place, you have to be careful. Certain CDNs will use HTTP2 push when you send the link rel preload header. And HTTP2 push is a topic by itself, but um, it doesn't take the browser cache into consideration as of today. 
So you may want to um, give it a no push directive because link rel preload will check the browser cache before requesting. HTTP push will push anyways. This is great to speed up critical resources like as said fonts and CSS or maybe some JavaScript. How's the support today? This is the support, but you can include it and when it comes down faster, well then it comes down faster. And let's please not annoy our users like shown in the video, right? And for me, this is kind of the AMP reaction. For the people that haven't heard of AMP, AMP was this JavaScript framework by Google, which is basically limiting developers to only do things um, that are fast, responsive, and offer a good user experience. So there's no way to do very shitty stuff in an AMP page because the framework is limiting you. And I was giving a talk two and a half years ago about AMP because I think technically it's very interesting. If you agree with the approach of AMP, it's a different story. But then Joff Weiss, he is a, um, one of the people that do a lot of web performance things and was like, that's not good. Because Google is also pushing AMP with their Google search power, right? That's not good. We have to have a standard solution to kind of limit what is possible at the website. And this is kind of cool because now two years later, I'm standing on stage again and I can tell you, well, we have that now, kinda. So there's the feature policy header with which you can use to say, hey, these features should not be allowed on my website. And this especially becomes very important when you have 100 different domains included in your website because you're using Google Tag Manager or anything like that. So what can you configure there? There's good stuff in there. I think that's very nice. But disclaimer, we're working on it, right? But it will be there very soon, hopefully. What is nice, though, is, are these two. So I'm always watching out for web performance, and guess what? You could set yourself a threshold, which is like, nobody that is working on this site should ship massive media, because this is what costs people money, right? I think this is cool. You can define these policies also for iframes, where we are again in the third-party topic, which is nice. And at a certain point in time, you will be able to access these via JavaScript API, which is still under discussion, though. So the list was probably gone too quickly again, but what happened to the most annoying one? Because the most annoying one was not in this list. Push notifications were included in the list, but browser makers then figured out that this will become actually a little bit trickier, and there is up for discussion how we can opt out of uh, push notifications in the future. And I'm really looking forward to that, because every site that asks me for permission for push notifications, oh my god. So what's the support here today? Um, at least for iframes, that is kind of usable. But again, you can use this, and if it's blocking something, that's better for the users that have this browser. And we should respect privacy. So browsers have this feature here, do not track. Right? This is in, in Chrome and Firefox. You could use it potentially. And the support for this is actually very, very good. Or let's say it was very, very good because Safari two months ago or one month ago decided to drop it. Why did they drop it? They drop it because people used this flag to fingerprint people. And think of this. There was a feature that should let people opt out of tracking and it was used for tracking, which is like... So we're kind of going back here. Safari is not supporting it. And I, I wish that, would, that this would have worked, but at the end, I think it was just a nice try. Because when the, the, the web's web today, when people have the opportunity to make money with your data, they will. No matter if they say they don't want that or not. And then at the same time, you see that browser vendors are going a different route. So uh, Firefox is actively pushing for more privacy. Um, Samsung includes machine learning at tracking protection because everything has to be machine learning these days. iOS is also ha coming with a tracking protection. So I don't think that the do not track thing will um, succeed in the future. But this is just my opinion here. So when we go to responsible, dev, respectful, you see that no permissions are asked because I set a header. And you see that this SVG was pushed up to the, uh, to the top of the waterfall. 
by just, by just setting a header, which is very cool, I think. So building for the web is actually very, very hard. There is so much information out there, and there, there are these kind of events where you just get information. It's like, oh, how should I know these kind of things? I mean, you have to think about a lot of stuff. Design, content, performance, accessibility, frameworks, network, devices, all these kind of things I should kind of check out, and there are even more. What could help you to build good stuff for the web? Well, we have Lighthouse, which comes with Google Chrome. It's in the audience, all, uh, audits panel. So this checks already a lot of things and gives you a lot of resources and hints on how you can make best app possible. Unfortunately, it's checking headers not as much as it should, maybe. And one tool that is not getting enough um, mentions out there is WebHint. This is the most picky tool ever. It is awesome. I'm working for months already to get all the mentions that are included in there out so that I have a complete green side with WebHint. This is built by Microsoft, so um, you can check that out. If I got, got you excited about headers, maybe, um, if you want to get a more complete overview, because I had to um, push a few headers out, like referral policy and the whole cookie topic, I didn't talk about this one. My friend Chep uh, maintains this slide deck, and it's an almost complete header overview. So if you want to know what's possible with headers, give this a try. Um, that's a super nice resource. So to close the whole thing, I believe that the web has to be safe. It shouldn't be possible that my mother mines bitcoins by browsing the web. That shouldn't be possible. I think that the web should be affordable because people use the web everywhere today. And we should make that possible that it is cheap and affordable for everybody. And I think that the web should be respectful because no one, nobody likes a person tapping on my shoulder five times when I'm walking around the street. So the web has to be safe, affordable, and respectful, so that it really is for everybody. And thank you very much. Thank you. I think we are all waiting for the time when we'll not get this notification about, this prompt about uh, push notifications. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for the time <laughs> where we're hard. So maybe some of you have some questions? Also, uh, okay, uh, then I have one question. So you said uh, that um, we can actually use these headers to prevent this, uh, some extra uh, features to be used, like push notifications, microphone, camera. So if developer of a website is responsible for doing that, so why, he, why, why we can just stop using uh, these snippets of code that are uh, opening this um, prompt for push notifications? So, so uh, we have, as you say, developer can just disable push notification on this site because just don't use this library, right? Yeah. So, uh, so it's a developer can just uh, manually turn off this push notification right now instead of using this header. Th that could work. Yeah. The, the thing is, kind of, um, a lot of times websites deal with I don't know 50 different origins, and just a random script is asking for that. Of course, if this is configurable, the developer can disable this. But when you have this wild world west of one million scripts, this is a way where you can opt it out. Of course, this kind of includes that the developer decides to not annoy the user, right? So it kind of all goes into the direction that developers want to be respectful. Yeah, so our, uh, it looks like everything goes down to that we do not uh, trust our libraries that we are using right now. Correct. Cool. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, make a round of applause for Stefan. Thank you very much.